This is Maritime Morning with Jordy Morgan on News 95.7. Welcome back to Maritime Morning for Monday, December 12th, 2011. I'm Jordy Morgan. His new Brunswick suffering from a culture of dependency. We'll talk with the co Minister Bernard Valcour about that. Dr. John Gillis will be by later on with his house calls. And we're also going to be talking about taxi security. In the wake of an attack on a Moncton, Moncton taxi driver, they're dealing with security concerns there. That's all coming up later in the program. But first, how is Nova Scotia dealing with online learning as the departments of education in this country struggle with uh, budget reductions and declining enrollment and school closures? Should we be getting out of the classroom and onto the laptop? One of North America's foremost authorities in the area is Dr. Michael Barber. He is uh, with Wayne State University. University and studies the effectiveness of online learning uh, throughout the different jurisdictions in North America. And he joins us on the phone this morning. Good morning, Dr. Barber. Good morning, Michael. What is the uh, what is the situation here in Atlantic Canada in terms of people adopting? I should, when I say people, I mean uh, uh, departments of education in the Atlantic provinces adopting online learning strategies. Um, well, three of the four provinces are actually doing quite well, those being Newfoundland and Labrador, Nova Scotia, and New Brunswick. Obviously, PEI, with its size and um, just geography, probably doesn't have as great a need, and uh, recognizing that actually uses services primarily from New Brunswick. Um, but the departments of those other three provinces, really for quite some time now, have been doing a pretty good job at providing these services to students in rural areas as you get the declining enrollments that you just mentioned. It's interesting because we don't hear much about it happening, and there's, um, I suppose, a, a higher level of interest now in this because of all of the uh, all of the uh, parameters that I was just discussing there. You know, the fact that we are dealing with declining enrollment and we are see schools closing and that kind of thing. You would think that there would be a bit more of an emphasis on that now. Let's talk about the individual jurisdictions because uh, Newfoundland, to my understanding, is doing a very good job. Why do they seem to have a bit of a, a, a step up on the uh, Nova Scotia or perhaps New Brunswick? Well, I guess to, to respond to the, the first comment you made about us not knowing much about it, I think that tends to be a Canadian thing. Um, you know, as a Canadian working at a U.S. institution, I always find it interesting that we know so much about what's happening on this front in the U.S., but in Canada, we're doing it at roughly the same rate. We were here first, but yet you don't hear much about it. I don't think we do a good job at tooting our own horns in that respect. Um, and in terms of your question there, I think Newfoundland and Labrador, simply because of its geography, it's it's the biggest of the, the maritime provinces. Um, if you exclude Prince Edward Island from the conversation, it's got the smallest population, lowest population density. Um, simply put, because of the number of rural schools it has, it just has had a need to do this. Mm. Well, let's talk. Let's talk about what we are doing then. Uh... As, I, as you mentioned, we don't seem to know much about it, or we don't. Perhaps we're not tooting our own horn enough about it. What are we doing out there in terms of online learning um, in the classrooms? You know, let's say in Nova Scotia. Um, well, actually, Nova Scotia has just gone through a bit of a change. Um, up until this year. There were several of the districts that were managing their own virtual schools, uh, which essentially were providing what we call supplemental opportunities for their students, meaning students were attending a physical school, but because they couldn't get one or two classes due to small student enrollment, they'd take those one or two classes online, but still from the school itself. Um, this year, the ministry or the department has decided that they are going to centralize things because they always provided the course management system. This is the online, essentially, computer program that houses all of the courses. But the district had to run their own programs. So what the department has decided to do now is they've decided to centralize that. So they're hosting all of the courses there. The teachers are still employed by the districts, and they still work out in the districts. Uh, but there's a, a little bit more control happening from the, the center there. Well, how does it work? To, to give me an example of, 
uh, an online course and how it would work. Where's the where is the teacher? How much engagement is actually um, at home, perhaps, or in the classroom, or uh, what what what's the how does it work? What does it look like? Is yeah, what you're asking. exactly. Um, well, basically, you'd have a, a student who might have say four classes or five classes during the day. Three or four of those classes, they'd go to their regular classrooms like they, any other student really in the country or pretty much around the world. Uh, for that one or two online classes that they have, they'd go off to a computer room or to the learning resource center or maybe a special distance education laboratory that was set up. Um, they'd log into this course management system where basically all of their content would be there. So if they wanted to, they could complete the entire course just with the, the, the static content that's in there, you know, the, the multimedia type stuff that, that um, I'm sure most of your listeners are probably familiar with. Uh, they could interact with their teacher through email and through discussions. Uh, most of these programs also provide what we call synchronous lessons or live lessons. So they would log into what we would call a live classroom. So they could interact in real time with the teacher. Uh, most of these live classrooms are set up, so there's like a whiteboard or a blackboard kind of uh, situation there, and the, the teacher can actually give presentations. They can work out problems there. The students can ask questions either uh, using voice, video, or just typing in uh, specific questions. So, And that level of interaction will vary depending on the course. Some courses are much easier to do with uh, more on your own, like say a social studies course where you don't need to know how to do step two in order to move on to step three, whereas say a, a science course or a mathematics course where you know that progression is critical, there might be more interaction in that kind of course. Or a French as a second language course where the, the speaking component is a critical part of the course. There'd be much more um, interaction, voice and video in that kind of situation. Mm -hmm. So what kind of uptake are we getting in terms of student enrollment in these types of courses in Nova Scotia? Um, Nova Scotia is pretty typical of most of the rest of Atlantic Canada. Um, right now, it's estimated that about 2% of all K-12 students in the province are enrolled in one or more online courses, which is about the same as what there is in New Brunswick, a little bit more than what you find in, in Newfoundland and Labrador. So while Newfoundland and Labrador got there first and have the perception that they're doing more, when you actually look at student numbers, they're a little bit less than Nova Scotia and New Brunswick. What would we aim for as a target if you know, we, we, we're starting to use our capacity in a in a more meaningful way, and I, I, what I what I mean by that is, uh, I get the sense that we have the technological capacity here in Nova Scotia and in many parts of Canada to be able to provide this sort of learning environment for far more uh, children. And uh, is that something that we are aiming to do? Um, I'm not sure about aiming. I can tell you that the, the national average in terms of participation is about 4%. So Atlantic Canada is about half the national average. Uh, British Columbia is leading the pact, um, and they are about 14% right now. 14%? Yes. Well, that's that that's a pretty significant difference than, you know, 2%. It is, and, and there's a specific legislative difference between the two provinces as well. Uh, British Columbia by far has the most extensive legislative and regulatory system set up to cater to distance education at the K-12 level, whereas most other provinces just have it laid upon essentially the old physical environment. Um, the main difference that BC has that I think encourages this is in the case of BC, the funding follows the student. So if you have, say, a student that might be enrolled, say, at two courses at a, a local high school in Dartmouth, mm -hmm. um, and two courses from an online school that's being offered by a school district down in the the, the, the south coast of, of the province, and then another one that's uh, you know enrolled in a fifth course from a virtual school that is based in Cape Breton. What would happen is the school in Dartmouth would only get 40% of that student's funding. The school, the virtual school that's down on the south coast, would get another 40%, and the school in Cape Breton would get another 20%. Um, so what it does is it creates a, a competitive environment 
for the students, not unlike what we see in the United States, actually. Well, it sounds to me like it's driving success out there, though. Um, or is, well, is numbers it... don't necessarily mean success. Um, one of the things that we found from the research so far is that based upon how we currently offer distance education and online learning, there's a certain type of student that's going to be successful. And unless a student has those specific characteristics or can gain them or has some kind of support at their local school for those things that they have to do, those soft skills, self-directedness, self-motivation, time management, um, you know, just logging into their online course when they're supposed to be and not on Facebook and YouTube and all those other <laughs> things that distract them. Um, you know, students that don't have that, that internal motivation tend not to do well in the online environment. But, but surely British Columbia is measuring their outcomes, are they not? And are they, are they that disparate from the outcomes that we're seeing in places like Nova Scotia or Newfoundland or New Brunswick? Um, in speaking with the folks at the ministry, they tell me that there's not that big a difference, although in all honesty, um, I haven't seen that data, um, so I wouldn't be able to tell you. Okay, so how do we measure success at this then? Um, well, I'm, I'm a big believer in that, you know, we need to be able to provide students with the opportunities that they want. And also we need to do that in a way that will ensure them a chance of succeeding. And, you know, just because we can move all of these students online and all of these courses online doesn't necessarily mean that we should. Um, some students just aren't going to aren't going to be successful in this environment. Mm -hmm. Some students don't need to learn in this environment depending upon what it is they plan on doing when they finish school. Okay, I, I'd like to uh, continue our conversation here and talk about some of the potentials uh, that are available there in an online environment and perhaps where this is all going and uh, perhaps uh, talk a little bit more about uh, ways that we could get there. We're talking with uh, Dr. Michael Barber, he's with Wayne State University. We're talking about online learning. I'd be interested to hear if you think that it's a good idea as well. Four five, or four zero five six thousand in Metro or one eight seven seven eight zero one eight two five five. If there was a broader curriculum available, or if you felt that there was, uh, it was more available for your children to take advantage of. If, Think of it in perhaps the context of homeschooling or uh, think of it if you're living in a rural community in Nova Scotia that uh, you would have access to more of this. Do you think that you would take advantage of it if it was perhaps more widely publicized or uh, more widely available? 4056000 or one 801 8255 We'll have more with Michael Barber from Wayne State right after this here on Maritime Morning. Maritime Morning with Jordy Morgan will return in a moment on News 95.7. Find out what's happening in Halifax and around the world without leaving your desk. Listen to us online at News957.com. This is Maritime Morning with Jordy Morgan on News 95.7. Welcome back to Maritime Morning. We are talking about online learning in its various forms and how we're doing here in Atlantic Canada. And as much that perhaps uh, these things come under criticism, maybe because we just don't know what's happening out there. And there are things that are uh, going on that are quite interesting. I'm speaking with uh, Dr. Michael Barber. He's at Wayne State University. He studies the uh, implementation of this stuff and uptake of uh, online learning throughout North America, and we're just discussing how it's being utilized here in the maritime provinces, or for the Atlantic provinces, for that matter, because I guess we have to bring Newfoundland and Labrador into this as well. Um, I mentioned just before we went to break, Michael, the, this idea of people who perhaps would like to homeschool, and we, we see more of it. Um, is this something that is, is this an option that people who might be interested in homeschooling would be able to uh, t take advantage of or utilize this idea that they could be engaged with, you know, existing curriculum or curricula and, and and instead of just using books in the sort of the traditional ways that, that this is actually advancing the idea of homeschooling a little bit? Um, 
Well, technically the answer is yes. Legislatively, I'm not sure because I'm not familiar enough with homeschooling legislation in the Atlantic provinces to be able to say. Mm -hmm. Um, But I can tell you that in the U.S., this is actually the fastest growing area of online or K-12 online learning is the full-time online learning where students don't go to school at all. They do all of their studies from home in an online format with one or more online teachers and uh, it was originally started back about a decade ago to specifically address or to specifically bring those that homeschooling population back into a public school setting one would think just intuitively that in areas where you do have rural populations uh, and we are quite well served here in Nova Scotia in terms of connectivity but when you have uh, kids that may be spread out over the countryside, that if the Department of Education was looking to perhaps uh, advance this a little bit, rather than going into the traditional kind of schoolhouse environment, that this would be something that would be attractive to to parents or people who live in those environments. In many respects, yes. You have to remember that people homeschool for different reasons, and often one of the case, one of the reasons people do homeschool is because they don't want their child part of the public school system. And if you put them in a online school that's run by the Department of Education, that's pretty public. Um, but you know, if they're being homeschooled because they're in a small rural area and they're being bullied at school, or if they have a say a specific learning disability or um, one of the things we see in the U.S. a lot is students, for example, with autism or Asperger's syndrome that seem to find great success in the online environment because you remove all of the institutional things about school that prevent that kind of student from learning. Mm. Are these done in conjunction with teachers that are online in specific time frames or or could, could this be done at any time of day? Uh, basically on their own time? Um, Generally speaking, what happens in those situations are like the example that I gave in school where the student can log into their their online course and complete the material that's housed there. Students can do that at any time of day, so they could get up at 3 o'clock in the morning if they wanted to and do it. Um, In addition to that, what the online teachers will do is they will schedule specific times that they're having virtual office hours or that they're having um, real live lessons. And the students would actually have to, you know, show up during that time, although in most cases the live lessons are recorded. So if you happen to miss it, you could go back and watch the recording. Um, you know, but so there's a little bit of both. You could do it pretty much any time you wanted to, but there are certain parts of it that you have to show up at a specific time for. <laughs> you know, we have the, the ongoing discussion about snow days here in Nova Scotia. I'm sure that you probably have it in the, around, uh, around Michigan as well. I don't know. Perhaps Michigan doesn't shut down their schools when it snows. But, oh, no. Uh, we get about 10 or 12 a year. You get 10 or 12 a year. Has anybody ever, or is that part of the discussion here that perhaps this may be a way to actually deal with, with, uh, things like that when, when school, when there are school closures and whatnot? Because people, I think parents, and I know it sounds, it would be difficult to implement, but, Surely, if they if they had to stay home, it would be. I'd rather have them online, you know, taking their science class than actually having to, you know, sitting around and, as you said, being on Facebook or or watching movies. Um, yes, it is part of the conversation, and, and it is happening. And um, this may actually be a good time to to start talking a little bit more as as opposed to online learning, the blended learning, because mm-hmm. the schools that I see that are are using blended learning, which are physical you know, brick and mortar, face-to-face schools, but their teachers are using these online tools, the course content, the learning management system. If you think about a, a regular teacher, you're coming to my classroom every day for history, and all of a sudden we've got a snow day. If I've got all of my content up into one of these online courses that we use sometimes in the classroom, but not always, if you can't come in today, I can just send you an email first thing in the morning when it's announced that school's not closing today and say, okay, if you go into Unit 4, take a look at Lesson 3, that's what we would have covered today. I expect you to have that completed by the time you walk in the door tomorrow. Yay! You know, you don't lose a day for that. And it's, 
it would be very easy to accomplish in terms of, of the ability to do it. Now, the, the technical side is a little bit, and obviously the training to get teachers and, and up to the point where they can use these tools effectively would be another hurdle. But it's, it's not unheard of. If you look at a jurisdiction like Singapore, for example, they actually have a, an online week where they shut down the entire school system throughout the country in these pandemic drills. So for an entire week, everyone from the five-year-olds right up through to the 18-year-olds learn online. Now, in order to be in an environment that does that, obviously the teachers have to be preparing the students, and for that matter, the parents, in order to be able to learn effectively in that manner. And they do this once a semester, so twice a year. Shut down the entire school system once a week just to practice what would happen if, you know, H1N1 came around and we were bird flu or some tsunami, although I suppose if it was a tsunami, they'd probably have bigger problems to worry yeah. about, like infrastructure. But, um, you know, if they had to shut down the school system for an extended period of time, how could they still cope? Well, you know, I think that uh, sending a lecture and a YouTube video and a text message of where they're supposed to do the, the other work would probably get it out there to everybody that needed to get it, at least in uh, in junior high school. But I, it really, I'm sure that there are parents and people listening to this going, well, why can't we, why can't we get there sooner? Because this is something that sounds like it makes a lot of sense. And technologically... The departments of education have an entire internet, separate other than the commercial internet, available to actually execute some of this stuff. So, what, what's it going to take us to get to get there? Um, well, I guess a couple of things. The, the first would be while. Well, the department already has a number of, of online courses that have been developed that they've been offering through either the district-based virtual schools or this year through the department virtual school, but it's only so many of them, and it tends to be the courses that don't get offered in the rural areas because of student demand. So those required courses, um, they're ten they tend not to be there. Same thing with, say, the junior high courses, the elementary school courses, because these students, for the most part, don't learn online in Canada, or at least in Atlantic Canada. So the first thing that you'd have to do is you'd have to essentially build the content for all of these things, which is a substantial undertaking if you think, okay, how do I plan out, you know, 110, 120 hours of instruction for, well, if you take, say, grade 12, might be 20 courses that are offered in the calendar, maybe 8 or 10 of them are already done, so that's, you know, 10 or 12 you've got to do. When you start getting into the elementary levels, you know, you're looking at about 8 or 10 courses or subject areas per grade, you know, 6, 7, 8 grades. That's an awful lot of content to build or to find in a fairly short period of time if you wanted to do that. The second, I guess, biggest hurdle that's stopping this is the fact that, you know, while you can do it technically, there's a difference between simply putting things up and then providing instruction in this kind of environment. And that means that we have to train our teachers. You know, it's, we've seen again and again that just the introduction of technology into a system doesn't have an impact on learning. Mm -hmm. What has an impact on learning is when the technology forces an improvement in how we teach that material. Well, Michael, uh, this is a, it's a fascinating area of discussion. I'm afraid that we've uh, used up all of our time, and uh, mind you, I feel like I could go on talking about it for another half an hour. But I do appreciate your insights. It's been uh, it's been very helpful. Thank you so much. Not a problem. I'd love to come back and chat again. Excellent. That's Dr. Michael Barber from Wayne State University. A quick tweet here just before we finish up it says, "Sounds great. However, you can't rely on." all students to have access to uh, computers or the internet and oh uh, is michael still there are you still there michael yes oh, could do you have a website that somebody could actually uh, find out more about this uh yes it's just michaelbarber.com okay michaelbarber.com that's uh, michael uh, m-i-c-h-a-e-l barber with an o-u b-a-r-b-o-u-r because he is a Canadian, uh, from Wayne State University. Thanks again, sir. Appreciate your time. Not a problem. Okay. Have a good day. You too. We'll take a break. Be back in just a couple of minutes. The news is next on Maritime Morning. Maritime Morning with Jordy Morgan will return in a moment on News 95.7.